Uh, Millsy, you know, I just started thinking about it. Do you think anybody uses the little, like, what is it called? Like uh, an anagram? I think I just said that wrong. Um, OMG for anything other than what we use it for? If they do, it's probably some weird corner case thing that no one wants to know. Well, you know, I was eating breakfast today and I was like, what if it was like oatmeal and oatmeal being the O and the M because it works. Don't at me at that. But and what's the G? Good. Oatmeal good. Oatmeal good. OMG. <laughs> Welcome back to Hometown Commander. <laughs> A podcast about Commander, the format that we all love and hate. <laughs> we all know and love and hate. And, a, and apparently oatmeal. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that. We are, we are here today. To pull back the curtain, you know, we, we come up with these intros to try to make each other laugh. And I oh, we do. We do laugh. <laughs> just do not have a response. Uh, no response on the stack. I'm going to pass priority. I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Oh man, uh, we had we had just a fun evening uh, not too long ago. Uh, let's let's pull back the curtain even more. Uh, it is pretty late, so much so that my words will slur. I'm pretty sure Millsy's words will slur. Uh, I am currently not sitting in a chair because I'm way too lazy to do that. Um, like I said, we we had a pretty great night. Uh, we just got done playing some games uh, where I got demolished. Uh, probably over half the time uh, we played a couple in a uh, if you know or don't know uh, what it's called a star format uh, that was my first time playing it I I actually genuinely enjoyed it uh, only having to knock 80 health out of the equation equation rather than it makes, it makes five player games a lot easier you know yeah. the problem with any five player game is you have to knock 160 life worth of people out of the game hopefully less um, but that was, I, I think the star format's really fun. Uh, the concept is the people directly next to you are not your enemies, but the people directly across from your enemies. You can still attack anyone you'd like at any time. You can still deal damage to anyone, but you win the game if your opponents is directly across from you uh, lose. So it actually does create situations where potentially more than one person could win at once. In fact, I forced one of those situations. But anyway, um, we are here today for another awesome episode of Head to Head. But before we talk about our Head to Head, Mikey. Oh, snap. What are we going to talk about before we talk about? We have a couple of cool things to announce in this episode, don't we? First off, yeah, what day is today that this episode is being released? Uh, today is <gasps> not Saturday. Sorry, guys. We love you that much that we want to give you an episode a day early now. On a Friday. Yeah, we we you know we looked at the analytics, and I know there's only so much analytics to consider, but we feel like maybe the episode would do a little better coming out on Friday. So they're going to be Fridays now instead of Saturday. Nothing else is going to change, just coming out Friday. The second big announcement, we're on YouTube now. Yeah, man. Hometown Commander on YouTube. We're going to put a link down in the description so you can head over to YouTube. All of our episode audios will be posted there. We're going to get them caught up, and they're going to be current, but... We're going to be doing some cool side videos over there. Maybe things that we want to do but we don't think would take up a full episode. We want to do some cool side content. We're going to be opening up our Kamigawa collector's box when we get that in. We've got a couple of cool ideas for little openings and talking about things. So we're really excited about that. But you know what we're going to plug. We got Rogue Energy. Head on over to Rogue Energy. Use that code HOMETOWN for 10% off. Um, we both need to put in a Rogue Energy order. We're slacking. We are. Uh, but we love it. We use it. And listen, we enjoy it. Listen, I'm going to start pouring like Rogue Energy inside my MacBook so that thing can have <laughs> enough energy to work its butt cheeks off to get these videos out for you guys. Like, I know that's obviously not how that works. We, we as Hometown Commander do not suggest that you pour Rogue Energy <laughs> onto your MacBook. <laughs> Hometown Commander is a podcast that does not condone pouring Rogue Energy and into your second laptop. link, Mikey, is our Discord. Pop down to that link down below. Yes. Join us on Discord. We're there way too much. But the reason we want you to corner the Discord is we got a contest yes. we, we introduced a week or two ago. We're going to give away one collector booster of Kamigawa. All you have to do is come over to our Discord. Uh, Mikey, you came up with the idea of 
Coagulate is yes. a magic card. So tell us what you think Coagulate would do. My thought was a removal spell, but you could take it any way you want to go. Yeah. Tell us what color it would be, how much it would cost, what it would do. We're going to pick our favorites, put you in a little contest, and make a drawing out of it and have some fun. Uh, here's here's the thing. Uh, what's funny is one of the guys that we were playing with is actually in our Discord tonight, and I don't know if any other ones are. Uh, Zach, if you're listening to this episode, love you, man. Uh, thanks for the uh, R2D2 Tamagotchi. Uh, but what's funny is he hasn't put in his like card. Like I I literally said to everybody, it's open to everybody. It doesn't. Yeah, have I mean to be, we like, we we've, we've told our personal friends. Yeah. That, you know, of course, we're not going to give them special treatment. Everyone that in everyone that submits a card will get um, will get entry entries, as well as we are going to prepare our own cards uh, just to reveal when we reveal the winner. We want to have fun. We want to do it too, just to have fun. I've been having a good time trying to figure out what I think uh, Coagulate would be as a card. And I hope you've done the same. I'm going to get a first grader to draw the art for it. Oh, 100%. That would be fantastic. It's going to be fun. I'm going to have so much fun with that. But, Mikey, we're here today for Head to Head. Yeah, we are. And we're doing a first for Hometown Commander. Our first five-color commander. Now, there's lots of five-color commanders that we could choose from, but we decided to go back for these last two. We, we kind of, to pull back the curtain, decided that we had hit those... Crimson Vow and Midnight Hunt Commanders that we cared about, that we really wanted to talk about. There's a few more we thought might be cool, but we put them on the list to do later. And decided to look back at the year. We randomly picked two sets over the last year or so to do uh, Commanders from. And the first of those two was Kaldheim, which I think gives away who our Commander is It's today. Golos, right? Yep, totally Golos. 100%. Uh, we're doing Golos. We're bringing Golos back. No, we it is... We don't care about your ban list. It is Essica... God of the Tree. Now, there's a lot of different ways we can take Eska, God of the Tree. I don't know why it's so funny. Just God of the Tree. So just like on a normal episode head to head, we're both using Eska. We both built her a little bit differently. Mike, you chose to go the God Tribal route. Yes, sir. I've chosen to go the Super Friends route. Yeah. So we're going to kind of break down why we chose those two routes. But first, let's read Eska. Eska, God of the Tree, is a legendary creature god. One green, green. Vigilance. Add one man of any color. Other legendary creatures you control have vigilance and add one man of any color. That is her front side. And the more used side of the two, especially on that brawl and historic brawl, open mouth puke, <laughs> is, is Prismatic Bridge. For Wooberg, you have a legendary enchantment that says, at the beginning of your upkeep, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a creature or planeswalker card. Put the card onto the battlefield and put the rest on the bottom in a random order. So... Mm. Really, our ideas for these two decks stemmed from this, right? Prismatic Bridge can either get a creature or a Planeswalker. You chose the creature side. I chose the Planeswalker side. And we did our best to make a Eska deck that we would actually enjoy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is how I would word it. Um, I This is a very interesting thing for me. I, I want to I offer it before we get into our lists, before we talk about our card choices... Put a pin in that five color decks tend to be very expensive because of their mana base. There's a lot of different ways you can build a five color mana base. And I think this is a good place to start because unfortunately for most people, this is our barrier to entry. Yeah. Expensive lands. And if you want to use your lands well, you got to play expensive lands. So, Mikey, you could tell me what your land structure is, but I'm running 10 fetches. Yep. I am running all five triumphs. All yep. 10 shock lands. Yep. And then I have chose to run the new Innistrad lands mm. as my other lands uh, because they do all come in uh, untapped pretty much as soon as we start getting going. As well as I'm playing a land that I have a feeling you're playing as well, which is the World Tree. <laughs> yes, I am playing the World Tree. Uh, the World Tree helps us a lot in making sure that when we have six or more lands, everything taps for every color, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, I am also playing Urza Saga and uh, Interplanar Beacon to play a little bit more into my Planeswalker strategy. I imagine you're probably playing some other of those uh, command towers or things like that as well. But yes. I wanted to start the mana base because I think it's really important to say that, guys, these decks are not going to be cheap because we need to make the mana base good. I've said it before. I'll say it again over and over and over again on this show. 
The mana base is one of the most important parts of your deck, and if you get it wrong, you'll bog down the best of your deck. But if you can even get a mana base right, it can even pull your deck to be better than it actually is because your mana's right. Yeah, definitely can agree with that. Uh, I think the one thing that I, I did add, uh, just I think not necessarily for flavor, but kind of, uh, I did put one of each of the basic lands in there. Uh, I, I had the slots for them, so I did it. Um, I know not the great. I know that's not the greatest idea, but I kind of just did it um, as just another little kind of fun tidbit, I guess, for myself. A little challenge for myself, I guess. So one, I think, depending on what kind of ramp you're playing, right? Uh, yeah, those can be useful if you're playing a uh, cultivator or Kodama's Reach or a rampant growth, you know, that style. Uh, those are really effective. Uh, whereas I am choosing to play more of the far seek three visits nature's lore we're going after the dual dual lands with forests and the you know so that way we can get those triumphs quicker if we can't get them off our uh fetch lands i'm just choosing to do a little more of the targeted ramp as opposed to the basics but i think both are completely viable it's just about building your mana base to always match your ramp so mikey we are on opposite sides of Essica, God of the Tree. I almost, I really want to say Essica of the God Tree, and I know that's not right. Right, yeah. Uh, but it, it sounds right, but it's not. So I have chosen to go the quote unquote super friends route, and you've chosen to go the gods route. Mm -hmm. So I think the best thing we can do to start here is, Mikey, just break me down a little bit of w how are you using the gods to your advantage? What is your goal with, with, your, god tri with your god tribe? Uh, we play gods. No. Uh, no, stop. That's <laughs> we just play gods. We play gods. Uh, no. Well, so when I made this deck, I wanted to try to fit as many as I could into the deck. That kind of made sense. Uh, what's hilarious is you know, Essica is from Call Dime and whatnot. I, I wasn't around during that time. I feel like if I was, I would have had a lot of fun with it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But what's really interesting is there's not a lot of call time gods here <laughs> uh i am using you probably guessed it more of the theros gods uh from both old theros new theros uh they're just ridiculous they are their effects whether they are a creature or not are just really really good and yeah you're probably sitting there thinking as a listener like but you're gonna need a lot of devotion well you're already gonna get one devotion from that backside of essica for each of them maybe even two if you're running one of the dual color gods so that's pretty great in of itself then you get another two if you're you have um another dual color god as well and remember every turn you're getting when that god is flipped face up it is a creature and an enchantment which means Eska is going to put it on the battlefield. Now, whether it enters as a, as a creature or not, it does not stop it stop the prismatic bridge from putting it down. Right. So that's the other great part is, no, it may not come down as a creature, but you you still get it. Right. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of other ways as well. Just I, I feel like just getting prismatic the prima <laughs> the prismatic bridge out uh, is is a huge key here. Um, so obviously. Use the land uh, land base that you have. Try to get to the prismatic bridge as fast as possible. Get that out. Start just working in uh, the gods as many as many as you possibly can. Like I said, the the cool thing about it is is even if they're even if the gods that I play aren't creatures at that time, and I'm not just playing Theros gods. Like I do also have like Scarab god, Scorpion god, and Locust god. Uh, because their value is just ridiculously good. I also have like God of Ronis and Oketra uh, from Amonkhet and whatnot. So like, it, I don't really just have to rely on the Theros gods to hopefully get to that five or seven devotion in whatever color I need to find that in. Um, I can find these still interaction plays uh, via combat or anything like that. I still have some blockers that are, oh, I don't know, uh, indestructible gods. I was going to say, once you get to that devotion, you have indestructible creatures that are going to be hitting hard. Yes. Not a curiosity, Mikey. Um, I don't know if you approached this the same way I did, but anytime we start building decks that are three colors or above, we need to pick a color or a color or two to kind of center our deck in so we can make sure that we are consistently hitting a mana of a certain color or a certain type. 
Um, I chose to center my list in that Bant range, green, white, blue, because it has most of the enchantment support. It has a lot of those creatures that care about Planeswalkers and um, even the spells. I think all of the spells that I looked at and cared about were in that green, white, blue range. Did you do the same or did you approach your deck differently? Uh, so looking at the gods, I, I, I did approach it differently uh, because, I, like I said, I just kind of wanted to smash them in there uh, to make it sound really dumb, but to actually kind of have an intellectual outlook on it. Um, I started to kind of realize that like the main color that was kind of coming through was oddly enough red um uh, mo the most uh color that i had out of it uh red and uh surprisingly uh, to nobody because of the tutor and just everything like or the tutors and everything like that uh red and black uh kind of came through the most for me um which was great because uh obviously i'm a huge fan of red and of course what we're saying here is that you're not playing no non-red or black gods what we're just saying is that you were finding that you're sharing a lot within those two colors yes which allows you to kind of focus down a little bit you still want all five right because yep. you still want as many of those gods active as mm -hmm. one time right but i think we both understand that in a hundred cards with five colors we need to realize that it's going to be tough to always get every color not necessarily on our lands, but I think to expect to have five or seven devotion to every color at one time is too much to expect, right? Right. So I think, you know, it's really one of those things where we have to push down and try to center just a little bit. Mm -hmm. so the reason I ask that question is, you know, I, I don't know if, Mikey, you felt this way about your decks, but I think if you look at any good three color deck or above, they always center in at least one color. Right. It's your way to make sure that you have a consistent mana base and that you're pushing um, in the right direction even if you're behind. So in my mana base, I actually cut some of the red and black lands because I have uh, green, white, and blue lands that tap for those other colors as well, which allows me to get that spread without having the red-black dual lands in the list. Um, same thing with... Um, same thing I noticed as well a little bit with uh, kind of red and some other colors. I noticed that red was the color that I wasn't really needing much of. It was really the other four, especially for all those tutors that we get in black, right? So I definitely f primarily focused on all of the dual lands and those that include those three colors, b blue, white, and green. And then whenever I had that extra slot, I would go for a red land. But I definitely noticed in some of the little bit of hand testing that I've done with it, that it's allowed me to keep those three colors core and always available. Now for you, right, you, you noticed your gods centering around those two colors right for me i purposely went and picked planeswalkers that i knew would fit the green white blue kind of center but maybe they had other colors or for my legendary creatures they're in those colors or they help me really go down to those core three you know because most of my spells ramps are in green right your board wipes are in white uh, your draw spells and your counter magic and that kind of stuff's in blue. And, and then, of course, we have the uh, tutors in black. So I wanted to make sure that I kept, um, and then I even noticed in my support enchantments, they're all in blue, white, and green. So what I really wanted to do was find a way to kind of nail down in a little bit. But you notice I'm still playing some double red or double black planeswalkers because I still can. They can still get flipped up off the top. But if right. I'm casting these guys from my hand, I want to make sure that I'm going to always have the mana available and ready to go to cast them. And I'm sure you feel the same way. Yeah. If you're casting those, hard casting those gods from your hand, you want to make sure that you're kind of finding your mana. So that's a little bit tougher than maybe some of the other commanders we've talked about so far because they've only been two colors and you kind of always have access to your colors. Here, we, we may not always have access to every color for the first few turns, and we need to be okay with maybe being okay with dropping the Prismatic Bridge on turn four or five instead of on turn three like we have before with our other commanders. You know, there's going to be a, a shift in our play style, and that's something I think with five-color decks that you have to 
start putting in the back of your head is that we're not playing the same mid-range game that we played with other colors or we're not playing the same timetable. We kind of have to pay attention to ramp becomes more important, draw becomes more important, everything becomes more important yeah. versus those two color decks where we could use a few artifacts to get us out of trouble. Correct. Although um, Arcane Signet becomes great here because our color identity is all five colors, yes. we can't get out of those troubles with just one of every Signet. We really need to play you know, smarter. So what uh, what are you playing for your uh, removal suite. You know, in five colors, we have access to the entire world as far as removal goes. Uh, what what were the kind of spells that you thought would be cool to run in, in your five color list? Because because I think there's so many. Yeah, and damn's a great a great <laughs> spell. I think there's so many cool choices here. Yeah. Um, uh, no, but I did. I actually did choose damn. Um, I, I like the card uh, for removal. Um, also, uh, Vanquish the Horde. I think is probably one of the better. Yep. Um, honestly, I I think it's one of the better removal cards we got last year that will probably be overlooked by a card that I'm looking on your list with, which is hilarious. Uh, I think Miho Massacre is a great card. Uh, I really do. But I, I think personally Vanquish the Horde is just better. Um, Vanquish the Hordes will be a commander staple by the end of 2022, if, if I had to guess. As if it's not, then people... It's, need to wake up a little it's bit. It's no, probably most of the time cheaper than Wrath. It's better than Doomscar, which was the other big, big, uh, of course, board wipe we got in 2021. Yep. It is a double white pip, which can be hard for some decks, but for most decks, if it's just down to two white mana, that's not bad. Nope. And it hits everything. I mean, that's what you want, right? Yeah. You want a board wipe to come down and everything. Uh, to continue with our like strategy talk, you know, you're playing the gods which come down as enchantments and can turn into creatures. I'm playing planeswalkers who come down and just continue to be planeswalkers. Yes. I don't really get any creature value out of my planeswalkers. So I'm playing a little bit of a token sub strategy to protect my planeswalkers because otherwise I have no way to protect them. <laughs> They're just going to sit there and be interacted with. Um, now I'm doing this in two ways. First with some cool token generators like Entreat the Angels, Martial Coup, um, Gelatinous Genesis, some of these spells that just create tokens right. for mana. Um, but I'm also playing Planeswalker cards that care about making tokens to even protect themselves. So, I mean, you think about the amount of, of, of Planeswalkers I had to choose from here. I wanted to get really intentional about what I chose. If it was going to be in there, it needed to be in here for a reason. So I kind of really like my Planeswalker list. And you can see it. Go down in the description. You'll see our Moxfield link. You can go see. I won't name off every Planeswalker that I'm playing. But I really tried my best to toolbox this out so that I'm getting removal, tokens, card advantage, everything. So that hopefully, you know, we can, we can find a, either the right Planeswalker off the top. Or if we need to go search for one, we can go search for the right Planeswalker um, in the right moment. Now that's kind of tough because we're in five colors and we need to make sure we have access to those five colors. But right. we get a couple really cool ways to do that easily. Uh, we mentioned the world tree, which if you have six lands, all your lands tap for anything. I know a lot of people don't play Chromatic Lantern anymore, but I chose to play it just so that if we get a little bit pinned down in the early game and we have access to it, uh, there's all of our lands tapping for any color. We get access to cool things like Dried of the Elysian Grove, which allows us to play an extra land per turn and also makes all of our land every basic land type. So hopefully that gets us towards the Prismatic Bridge on you know, maybe a turn sooner or a little bit easier. Um, but I was really excited, at least from my list, I mean, we can start talking about more of like our fun picks. I was really excited to start playing some cards that really care about uh, Planeswalkers. I put Karth the Lion in here from Modern Horizons 2, who allows our Planeswalkers abilities to cost plus one more. So if you have a negative one ability, it technically costs zero. zero. And if you have a plus ability, it actually increases by more. Mm -hmm. um, Karth's a really cool card, and I think it fits the deck really well. We have Spark Double, which is gonna, which can come down, copy a Planeswalker, and make the second copy not legendary. So we can actually have two copies of a Planeswalker, which is huge. Uh, we have Vorinclex, 
to simply just double the amount of tokens that come or the amount of uh, loyalty that come in and um, will actually help when you're using your uh, abilities. And then I found a really interesting card in my searches that I'd never seen before. And I think it's kind of interesting. It's called Deep Glow Skate. Four and a blue for a three, three fish. When it enters the battlefield, double the number of each kind of counter on any number of target permanents. Well, loyalty is a counter. counter yeah. So when this comes in, it can actually double all of our Planeswalkers loyalty, which I think is really interesting. I can copy this with Spark Double if I wanted to do that. Um, this is not legendary so if we wanted to play a uh some copy spells to copy creatures we could do that i think it's just a really interesting way to play more into my planeswalker strategy i am playing a lot of the oath cycle uh, for those of you that don't know what the oath cycle is it's a set of legendary enchantments that were released kind of during that era of the goat of the of the gatewatch there's one for each member of the gatewatch and they all have different effects the main goal of the ones that I've chosen to play, uh, Johnny, Gideon, Nyssa, and Teferi, is just allowing... Johnny allows my Planeswalkers to cost one less. Gideon says that the Planeswalker comes in with an additional loyalty counter. Now, it's not on cast, so if it's out and Prismatic Bridge puts one down, it still gets the extra. Nyssa says you can spend mana as though it was mana of any color for Planeswalker spells. And then Teferi allows loyalty abilities to your Planeswalkers to be used twice per turn. So all of these oaths really come down and just allow us to uh, hopefully benefit the, our Planeswalkers. And then I'm running a card that I took out of my Shrines page, uh, a deck, uh, Five Color Shrines deck I've been playing for a long time. So if we read the back of, if we read the back of Essica, um, Prismatic Bridge says at the beginning of your upkeep, you reveal the top and you flip it. There's an enchantment from a little bit ago called Paradox Haze that allows you to enchant a player, and that player technically takes two upkeeps. So my thought here was enchant ourselves with Prismatic Bridge out, and now we're getting two Prismatic Bridge triggers a turn. Yes, it's one card in the 99, but we can go search for it. But my thought here is, man, if, if we can get a couple good uh, Planeswalkers off the top of our deck, a lot of these are trying to work together to make tokens, keep ourselves safe, and then once we feel safe, actually start attacking. Um, and I think that, that'll actually benefit us a lot. I'm playing Ghostly Prison, I'm playing Propaganda, yeah. playing Sphere of Safety, trying to get us to be a little tougher to attack because we're going to need some time, probably in our list, more than your list, to get set up because we need to make those Planeswalkers work. Uh, but I think our list should do a good job at kind of keeping that first few turns, keeping us safe. Another card I'm really excited to play in here because I've seen it played too many times and I've never had the privilege of playing it. And that's Ink Shield. Mm. This is a card that came out in uh, C21. For all combat damage, that will be dealt to you this turn. And for each one damage printed this way, you get a 2-1 Inkling creature token. This is a great card that we can leave our mana up for since, permit, since Prismatic Bridge gives us that Planeswalker for no mana. We could leave this up, use it, to defend ourselves. Now the only bad part about Ink Shield is it says to you, so if they attacked our Planeswalkers, we wouldn't be able to defend that. Yeah. But I think most of the time, you know, unless that Planeswalker is really good, they're swinging at us anyway. Hopefully we can keep some combat, that, that combat type trick up and hopefully gain some uh, tokens that way. But, but a lot of my cards are just ramp, creating tokens, to defend our planeswalkers and then hopefully getting our planeswalkers out to either negatively affect our opponents so we're playing stuff like three mana to fairy from war spark try to stop our opponents with interacting with our planeswalkers we're playing uh one of the one of the everyone's favorite band cards from standard oko thief of crowns can do some fun stuff with getting rid of other players permanence uh, we're playing ashiok from war of the spark to kind of play with some graveyard strategies playing a lot of Planeswalkers that create tokens. Elspeth, Garrick, Liliana, Lolf, Mordekain, and um, Renin7. All of these Planeswalkers that create tokens, you, or you can create tokens when they come down, and it's just going to allow us to protect ourselves and hopefully farm these, um, 
farm these planes orcas for good value uh, one of my favorite picks in the deck if we can get it to work um out at the same time is Kazmina from Strixhaven. Her first ability says each other Planeswalker you control can use the loyal abilities of Kazmina. Um, so that top ability is a plus two and a scry, which is a lot of loyalty for most Planeswalkers. So that's really cool because uh, when we have other ones out, they can use some of these abilities instead of their own. Um, Kazmina does allow you to make a token on its body. So this is helpful to give maybe one of our Planeswalkers who can't make tokens um, and allow them to do that. And I think it just helps kind of round out our Planeswalkers so that if we get two of them together, hopefully they synergize at least a little bit when they're out together, as opposed to just being a more basic toolbox where nothing ever kind of fits. You know, we want to make sure that our Planeswalkers, when they're out, uh, they want to stuff, fit like, stuff like Kesamina, uh, combo with Karth. Do you know, like, off the top of your head, if, like, any of your Planeswalkers can get to, like, the alt or as we would consider like an ult, um, maybe after like one go around or anything like that. I think of course with the O's out, we get there a lot quicker. Most of them need at least one turn. Some of them require two, but I think the good part about Casmina is you can speed up that process, right? Yeah. You can, you can get there even quicker. You know, most of these guys, their ultimates are nine or 10. And most of them come in with four or five. So we really need that couple turn window. But I think if you get a Karth, you get a Kazmina, or even you get one of those Oath of Teferis where you can use two things in one turn, man, you're really going to speed up. You're really going to speed up the process as far as getting them there. Now, not all of them are in their two ultimate, but right. the ones that are in their two ultimate are, are very good once yes. we get there. Yeah. Uh, very, very good. So I think it's cool that... I try my best to choose Planeswalkers that every single ability on the Planeswalker is useful. It can help us to some degree. Um, there's a good mix of the War of the Spark Planeswalkers that are that have the you know world abilities and only minus down with traditional Planeswalkers who have both pluses and minuses. So the hope is that kind of no matter what comes off the top of our, de our deck, we can use it for something. Yeah, man. Uh, and I'm sure you feel the same way about the gods. You know, all of the gods have some crazy effects that when when you start mashing them together can create some cool board states. That's what I really like about this challenge is, although we're playing two radically different strategies, I think we've built some pretty cool toolboxes of you for creatures and me for planeswalkers where uh, no matter kind of what comes off the top, we're going to try to hit it in stride and push our strategy forward. And... Uh, I'm sure that your list of uh, artifacts and enchantments and that kind of thing is to help you push that strategy along as well. Yeah, you know, whereas mine are all planeswalker focused, I'm sure yours are creature focused, and you're and you and you know and 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 you're kind of changing it. It's I'm sure that our maybe our instants and sorceries might look similar, but I think everything else looks different, and that's what's so cool is once you change a strategy, how much a deck can just fall away and change. Right. I like the. Uh like the support that Super Friends have gotten, the Planeswalkers have gotten all together. Uh, stuff like Karth, stuff like uh, the Oaths. Uh, I think those are great. Um, I remember back when I first started playing, back in 2014, 2015, and we joked when we saw the Commander 2014 uh, little, little set come out and, you know, Planeswalkers were the commander of those decks. And my friends and I, we back then we 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 kind of joke about having like a bunch of planeswalkers in a deck and whatnot. And, and back then, when we first started playing, I mean, we probably had I don't know those commanders and those were the only ones that, or excuse me, those planeswalkers and those were the only ones that we had for a while. Um, we we bought all but the blue one. I don't even remember who was on top of the blue one anymore. I think it was a Teferi. I think it was Teferi. Because why not? But anyways, that's beside the point. And anyways, but it's just so interesting to see how much support they've gotten over the years um, and how many have come out over the years. We think about it. We get two to, we get two to four a set. War of the Spark added one in every color combination, so you had so many different choices. Yep. And I think what's interesting about Super Friends is... Look at how many different types of Super Friends lists you have. You have your three color lists with, uh, in Bant or in others. Uh, uh, Karth the Lion himself does have a 
playing a, 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 a Golgari Planeswalker list with just bl- yeah. green and black, and they have some pretty cool options there. Remember, you get all of those uh, colorless Planeswalkers as well. You get your four color Atraxa lists that play a lot of different Planeswalkers there. Um, I mean, heck, you could probably just play a mono green Vorinclex Planeswalker deck and be decent. I'm sure you could, and 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 you know you would you would fit it so well to your creatures that it would probably hit in stride. You know, whereas when you get up to these more colors, you kind of use if you know what when I was when I sat down to think of which Planeswalkers to put in this deck, it wasn't necessarily specific cards. It was okay, which 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 Planeswalkers have a couple good cards that I can look through. Uh, well, Garrick makes tokens. Liliana normally makes some tokens. Uh, Lolf made the tokens. Uh, you know, the Teferis are pretty good for control. Uh, you know, Ugin the Spirit Dragon was one of the first ones on my list. It's just such a good card. Yeah. Um, I had considered Nissa for the deck, but I didn't because I didn't think I had enough synergy with the forest to make it work the way I wanted it to. But then when I went in and actually did the scryful search, looked through these Planeswalkers, man, it was cool to kind of put my little my little toolbox together in the same way I expect you searched gods and you realized <laughs> that there was more than just Theros I mean I, I know you know about the other gods but yes. when you got to really read the gods you were like man this works a lot better than I thought it would or man this really works you know you not only got Theros you got the five Kaldheim gods we got the oh Amonkhet gods twice yep. once in uh, well, Amonkhet well, and then some of them in War of the Spark I was say, all but one yeah uh, and of course, War of the Spark added a few new ones mm-hmm. as well. So it's just interesting to see all of the different options you have for gods too. Yeah. Instead of just the ones that you may think of immediately. Yeah, uh, like a uh, one that I actually kind of enjoy that I didn't think I was going to was like uh, I'm probably going to say the name wrong, uh, Valky, God of Lies. Yep. Uh, which obviously the backside is a Tybalt. Uh, which is a very good table, just ridiculous. Um, but like that still works on either side, which is hilarious. Uh, f- with uh, the prismatic bridge, if I want it to be, uh, you know, uh, Valky, then I can do the Valky thing and do the God thing and have more gods. But I mean, I could still also go with the planeswalker route as well if I wanted to. Uh, I don't think you can put it on Tibble off of the prismatic bridge. I could be wrong, but I think you have to put it in as Valky. Um, because you're not casting it, you don't have the choice. You know, normally you have the choice when you cast it, which side you want to cast it as. I think with all those double face cards, it would have to come down as Valky. But hey, that's just as simple as bouncing it, or you know, I don't know. That would be a ruling question. I'd have to look up. You know, I. I it's hard sometimes. You know, you try to build these decks and you try to get this understanding of the rules, mm-hmm. but you can't always. Get of uh, all no of them. for sure, yeah. right? And you have to take your educated guesses as far as what you think things could do. If that's the case, killer, right? Because then you have your choice. But if it's not, um, maybe you run a ways to bounce them back so you can put them back down again. Or um, and maybe if it's not the case, you decide, hey, maybe Vokey isn't as good as you thought it was. And yeah, there's another god you can place in that slot. No, that, of course. Um, I mean, and there's other things I could be playing as well. And I guess the other question is, how often are you really going to see it off the Prismatic Bridge? You're not guaranteed to see it, right. right? So you still have your choice, right? So, I mean, there's all these different considerations than just, uh, well, if it comes like this, I need this. I, yep. think th- I think it's a mistake we make a lot sometimes as brewers is saying, well, I can only do this with this. And if not, then it's not going to work. Right. Well, how often is it really going to work that way? You have 99 cards in your deck. The points you get Prismatic Bridge down, you might have 80 or 84 left in your deck, or 88, or whatever the number may be. How likely are you to hit Valky as the first god off the top of your deck? Yeah. You know, so it, as much as it's to say, maybe that's not as much of a nombo as I think it is, if it's in your opening hand, it's still fantastic. Yes, of course. So it's easy to say, well, this card doesn't work the way I want it to, but we have to remember that we're putting cards in slots to function no matter what our opening hand is, no matter what we kind of progress through our game plan, right? And with a five-color deck like this, it's not as 
cut and dry as maybe our first three episodes, right? Where everything fits a tribe and everything fits a theme and everything's right. pushing the same theme forward. We still have it here, but we're dealing with a whole lot more moving parts than we were before. Correct, yeah. Uh, adding more colors definitely adds more of a, uh, a thought process into not just brewing, but also just playing itself. Uh, trying to you know fit in the right combinations uh, that are gonna just you know give you those advantageous advantageous moments. Um, I, I man, I wish honestly, I wish I could like just kind of go into this like super in depth um, way of saying, man, if you play this god and combo with this god, but it's like it it is it is exactly what it is. You're with my deck, you're literally gonna play a god, look to play another god, and then hopefully play another god. And then maybe even play one more, um, and then hopefully have a great little fun time. Like, if you have something like a Mogus, and then have a, Ni- a Nylea, either one, uh, <laughs> and then have you know maybe like, uh, let's say before he, or no, that's not a bad, that's a bad example. Um, let's say that you bring in like, uh, oh geez, um, one second, one second. I believe this is it. Yeah. Uh, like a something simple, like a Kovori, uh, God of Kinship, uh, from Call Dime, uh, two colorless, uh, two green pips, uh, a two four, as long a uh, legendary creature, you can guess subtypes God. <laughs> as long as you control three or more legendary creatures, uh, Kovori gets plus four plus two and has vigilance. So I mean, just getting the different synergies of having legendary creatures. Uh, this is almost kind of like a legendary creature matters deck, but more on the side of just looking to smash a bunch of gods together that can give you so much value. So uh, now on every single upkeep with like Mogus, you'll see people either losing life or losing creatures. Uh, with in in your combat and your interactions, you'll have a better setup with Kovori being a little bit bigger. Uh, that's a 6-6 six, six creature for, for 4 mana. I think that's pretty great. I mean, anytime you can get a creature whose power and toughness is more than you paid for it, mm-hmm. I, I think I think it's worth the, worth the weight in gold, right? Oh, yeah. And then you just uh, continue to just do value with something like Kovori. Uh, you know, she also has, if you pay one colorless mana, one um, green, tap her, look at the top six cards of your library, you may reveal a legendary creature card from among them and put it into your hand. Uh, put the rest on the bottom of your library in any random order. So now you're just g- gaining more and more uh, of these gods that are going into your hand that can continue to be pushed out, uh, more or less drawing a card. Because, y- yeah, like I'm, I'm running 35 gods, I, I, or excuse me, 35 creatures, and all but I think four or five of them are subtype god. So, yeah. And all of them are legendary creatures. So you're just going to continue to push out as many uh, of them as you can. I also have like stuff like Ilharg, who can help me get more creatures out. Um, Witch Nylea, you, you know this. Witch Nylea makes them uh, cost cheaper. I think I just... Yep. Uh, is Keen-Eyed. Keen-Eyed uh, yep. makes creature spells cast one less, which all of them are. Even the uh, Theros gods, even though they come down as enchantments, if they don't have the right devotion, the spell still says creatures so that's a cheaper spell i guess that's a good distinction to make that only the theros gods care about your devotion correct every other god type uh is going to come down as a creature correct so i guess that's a good distinction to make just to make sure we're on the same page about what we mean when we say it might not come down as a creature we are only referring to the theros gods and not anything else which i think Forgive us, listener, on that. We are the most used to the Theros gods, so when we think of gods, both Mikey and I, uh, it is the Theros gods that, are, that come to mind first as opposed to the others. For sure. So, so, Mikey, I think this deck, these two decks, are going to be probably some of the most opening hand dependent decks that we've talked about on this series so far. Um, every other deck that we've done so far and our seventh uh, deck after this... Um, benefit a lot more from kind of having mediocre hands and being able to ramp or 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 get some man artifacts down and kind of fix our problem uh, i think these two decks are going to have to really pay attention to what is in our opening hand and what we want um i was sitting here you know while you were talking trying to determine what is an opening hand that is acceptable and I, I really think out of all the decks that we've done so far, 
This is the deck I care the most about front loading as many lands as I can in my opening hand because I'm trying to hit five to get Prismatic Bridge, right? I really want at least a fetch land, if not more. I really want a mass of three or four lands in my hand so that those first turns, even if they're coming in tapped, I'm still moving in the right direction. Uh, from there, I think any piece of any piece of uh, ramp or tutor is is like really good and necessary. But I think um, I'm less concerned about a planeswalker in my opening hand. Mm -hmm. I'm more concerned about lands. So, Mikey, you're laughing because I, I'm I'm sitting here uh, on Moxfield <laughs> while we're recording, yeah. uh, looking through my list, and I had scrolled down and hit deal in our hand a couple times just to see. Yes, I know the shuffler is what it is, but I, you know, I just wanted to see what my ratios would be, and I just pulled what I think is probably one of the best best hands I've ever seen in a five color deck: six lands, the world tree, and a fetch, uh, field of the dead, and dried of illusion and growth, which just makes all of your lands tap any color. I think this is a literal god hand. Uh, yeah. Pun intended, because it it would get me prismatic bridge on turn five, even if uh, even if illusion grow gets removed, I think it's still there. Yeah, um, I was literally about to say like my opening hand for this deck or either one of these decks would be at least five lands, <laughs> honestly. Uh, and if they're not all, you know, they, if they don't all have my five colors in them, then at least I still have the land drop that I need every single turn for the next few turns because um, I know that, that the creatures are going to come for me I know that uh, the planeswalkers will come uh, for your deck eventually you're able to stay in this game planeswalkers wise with your amount of removal or your uh, amount of tutoring uh, your protection spells are great up there as well so I, I, I think having at least it's so weird to say this, but having at least five lands in your opening hand would be so, 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 so key. This is the only deck that I can think of in my time playing Commander. Well, I, I feel similar way about my Five Color Shrines list. Mm -hmm. I think it has the same limitations, but this is the only deck I've ever played where having less than four lands in your opening hand might be a is a really bad thing. Mm -hmm. Like in a lot of other lists, you can deal with three and a piece of ramp and, and some other stuff or two and some ramp, right? Yeah. But in this deck, I mean, we really want to know, we really want a fetch no matter what. And we want to know what we're getting off the fetch right away. You know, we that's, I think, why the first turn or two is going to be most so important in this deck and both of our decks is knowing what we're going for right away. Right. You know, and getting there. I think... The other thing we have to keep in mind is that the most important card to our strategy is an enchantment that does not have indestructible, it does not have hexproof, and it does right. not have shroud. So just because we play the prismatic bridge on that turn does not mean we untap with it. That is a perfect uh, way to... Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have to also keep in the back of our head that just because we play the prismatic bridge does not mean we lull win and then figure yeah, it out from course. there. Yeah. We, we, there's some work we need to put in once the prismatic bridge drops down um, and hopefully we can kind of push that forward. I've tried to do that a little bit by playing one or two extra turn spells to play a little bit of protection, uh, you know, Teferi's protection, uh, maybe one or two bounce spells in case I want to bounce the prismatic bridge back to my hand, at least make it a little bit easier to recast so it's not expensive. Right. Uh, as well as playing some of those pillow 40 type ways to just protect myself uh, on the worst case scenario that it does go back to the command zone. Yeah. Now I have to play seven for the prismatic bridge. I think the only downside to Eska as a commander is that if you're not using Eska for the front side, you have to accept the opportunity cost of having the prismatic bridge out and how expensive it can get quickly. Now the one thing that I will say that I have a little bit of the advantage over you with is that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, and if I'm going too far, I'm very sorry, I still love you, <laughs> is I do get the advantage of the front side more than you do uh, because you're just rolling with planeswalkers and a handful and literally because you have five creatures in your deck, um, whereas like I get the advantage of if I need that extra bit of mana, I can play the front side and just continue to just mana, 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 mana ramp. 
uh, with all my legendary creatures that I do have in the deck. The other benefit is you get to play Path of Ancestry. You you get to kind of get that small synergy because your commander here is a god. I think Eska is still usable on the front side. It gives me the mana. It gives other legendary creatures I control uh, the ability to tap for mana, which is not as prevalent in this deck. No, yes. But if I don't think I can get to the Prismatic Bridge and I need the mana, I can go into Essica at three mana and have a mana source. I've tried to also build the deck as much as I can to survive without the Prismatic Bridge, to draw enough cards, to set up enough tokens to kind of make sure the strategy hits. But I don't think either of us can say that we can our decks will completely function without the Prismatic Bridge. It's, yeah. it's too important to our strategy. In fact, I would argue it's why we're playing Essica over other five-color commanders. Of course, I will always say that with this, our first cast of our commander will be the backside no matter what, uh, which I was actually thinking about it just a second ago. I, I've, I've never played with a du uh, double-sided, so I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you could probably play Prismatic Bridge first. If it goes back to the command zone, you can then cast Essica on our front side, um, both sides would increase by two every time. So that's back. perfectly fine because you're not losing any mana there because you're only casting Eska for five now, which you already which just, isn't bad. Which you just did with Prismatic Bridge. Yeah. If you lo if you just lost it, of course. Um, so I mean, I I think that's I think it's just a great little little tidbit there to kind of think about uh, as a player if you're playing Eska, like you're obviously going to try to look for a. Um, a prismatic bridge play as fast as you possibly can. Uh, I did a I did a hand as well, and I actually am very proud of this hand. I would like kiss this hand, literally on the lips if it had some. Uh, I I drew a planes, um, steam vents, command tower, spear of Heliod, Teferi's protection, marsh flats, and a dark selling ignot. Um, I get to play prismatic bridge turn four. That's pretty great. I and mean, anytime we can get it out quickly and 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 consistently. And then hopefully, if I can, our goal. if I can untap with it, uh, I get its fairies protection. Uh, so I'm going to leave mana up for that. I'm going to continue to just wait for an opponent to just more or less waste a spell because then I get to phase out, uh, unless they, of course, they have a counter. But that's beside the point. Because um, you know, counters do exist. Oh right? man, counters exist. <laughs> I think this is the portion of our show where normally we would go into maybe <laughs> what would be the pricier cards in our list. Oh golly! Um, unfortunately, <laughs> listener, the mana base alone is expensive. I, I don't think I could pick expensive cards out of this deck because everything is expensive. I think you need to, as a listener, if you're interested in a five color deck, you need to understand that it's going to be expensive on every level your lands your spells yes. you want to play those tutors you're going to need them um some of these planeswalker cars are cheap some of them are not some of my creatures are cheap some of them are not you know i think this whole deck has important cards that are expensive that i don't think we can cut to farm out for something else yes this planeswalker toolbox could change if there's a Planeswalker that's too expensive, I'm sure I could find a Planeswalker to fit its spot or do something similar. But if your buried entry of price for this deck is a certain level and you determine that you need to start playing with the mana base, I would say maybe this isn't the deck. <laughs> yeah. I think the mana base is the most important part, and I think it's the part that needs to be solidified and consistent and and maybe you take the price out from elsewhere but I, to be honest mike you're looking at the list i don't know where to take the price out of a every section every type of card in this deck just has expensive picks because they they are good at what they do uh, and, th and we yes. need them yeah um i mean i think the i just I, I i'm looking at all these price prices for some of these cards and it is uh not 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 the most fun uh especially if you want like gods have had some great artwork over the past couple of years and whatnot so i mean if you want some crazy artworks in those uh good luck uh is the only thing i can say to that i mean we've said this before in the past and we'll say this constantly again and again if you have the money and the resources to do that hey go for it when i can tell you not to um but for the average magic player uh this is something especially on a god's kind of side uh, even on the planeswalker side as well this is something that this would probably be like oh hey i have like 25 gods somehow collected them or traded for them and in, in my staple binder or whatever 
Uh, Oops, all gods. Oops, Oops, all gods. Here we go. Or if I have a bunch of planeswalkers, because we all know, like you just said, we're going to get planeswalkers constantly from here on out. Like, you know, we we just saw, we we have now seen, what, two or three for Kamigawa? Am I only thinking of two? I think we have seen, we have seen one, two, three. Three. We've yeah. seen every planeswalker that'll be in the set, and you know we had we had three. Pardon me, three in Midnight Hunt. Yep. We had two or three in Crimson Vow. So just think yep. about the amount of uh, planeswalkers we're going to continue to get. And you know what? If there's a planeswalker in this list that's too expensive, but you have access to a newer one, or Dude, yes, I'm looking at my list of planeswalkers here. The oldest Planeswalker card on this list isn't even the most expensive. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, the oldest Planeswalker card on this list is Elspeth, Sun's Champion oh, from, uh, I believe, original Theros, and then she got the reprint in the in the deck. In the dual deck, yep. Um, she's not even the most expensive Planeswalker in the deck. In fact, uh, I just did a quick scroll, and it is uh, Liliana, Dreadhorde General, well, is course. the most expensive, which I am not surprised at because uh, it's a it's a very good Planeswalker card. That card is great. Um, it's sad that it beats out U- U- Ugin, who has been traditionally one of the best Planeswalker cards ever made. But Fun fact, um, you can combo it in a lot of ways to get to its ult after one little bitty thing. Golly, that card is great. But, uh, so I think that, I, I would love, you know, in other, in other episodes, Mikey, you know, we've gone through card by card and suggested alternatives, but it's tough for me to do here. It's tough for me to give alternatives in a manner that I feel is beneficial to the user if they don't use it. So I think the best question to go from here would be, uh, would you build this deck? Mikey, would you build a Essica God's deck? Uh, so I would, God's deck? No. Uh, I chose God's because I have a more passion for them. I, I can't really feel like I play Planeswalkers uh, really well. So I went more of the gods route because I knew, or I, excuse me, I know how to play them a little bit better. They're creatures, it's plain and simple. You play them, they do stuff kind of things. Um, I feel like I'm not as good uh, as a Planeswalker player as I should be, or I want to be. Uh, but I actually like the Planeswalker idea more. I think it has a little bit better support uh, for it. Um, but honestly, the, I think the, the answer comes down to if I had the mana base for this, which you just already said this multiple times, and we'll probably continue to say this multiple times for a lot of decks. Um, if I had the mana base for this, it immediately would probably be thrown into some kind of test box. Uh, just because it just seems like a lot of fun to try, uh, whether it be Planeswalkers, route, uh, Super Friends, or uh, in my case, the Gods. Um, I, I think I would like to have a lot of fun with the at least the Theros gods. Uh, you know, they have a lot of nostalgia for me and stuff like that. But they also are just really freaking good. Um, some of them are really good in this in this scenario, at least. Um, but yeah, no. If I had the mana base, oh yeah. What about yourself? I'm gonna steal the answer I gave for uh, our blood list, which I still intend to do good on my promise to at least try it. Mm. Um, if <clears throat> I have been really pursuing five color shrines and you know, we have some new ones coming out in Kamigawa. So as far as five color decks go, that has been the deck that has got more of my attention. Yeah. But if it failed, if for any reason I did not think the shrines were viable, I couldn't find a list that I liked. I think this is the shell I would go to. Um, I'll give the same thing. I will vow to at least try this. I think maybe the planeswalkers could be shifted slightly to kind of fit you know, maybe there's some in there I think look good on paper, but when you play them out, they don't really work as well. And maybe I can shift them around, you know, to try to make the list a little better. But I like the list. I think it's interesting. I think the difference here is I think this list stands a little better on its own than maybe some of the others. I think yeah. it looks really good right on paper. I think the only change that would come would just be finding your tempo and maybe switching out a few cards or maybe some of your pet cards to kind of make it feel your own you know as opposed to just taking the list plug and play and and rocking uh but i think it's a really fun deck i think both these ideas are really cool and uh if our play group ever gets to the point where we have a proxy up a five color deck night i would love to pull this out and have some fun with it right uh but uh at least for the moment the shrines have my heart with Mm -hmm. the new ones coming out and i think they are a little more of a priority for me right now. But a- again, we are 
to pull back the curtain one day into previews. When uh, when you're hearing this episode, we will have seen a lot more previews than we have right now. We'll have a whole another week's worth of previews to see. So I'm sure my answer will be answered between you know the time we recorded this uh, listener and the time that you listen to, uh, to this episode. But um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, this is a really fun episode for me, at least. I like five color. It's a challenge. Oh, it's same. Balancing colors out and trying not to go too heavy, but try to make it really effective. But next week, Mikey. Next week, we are playing a Simic Commander. Oh yeah. Um, I'm trying to think if I can give away the set if it'll give away the commander. Uh, it wouldn't. It will not. Because there were, uh, I believe, a couple from the set. Oh, man, so we I are playing a Simic Commander from Adventure of the Forgotten Realms. Man, this is a commander I'm really excited for. I'm super excited. For, for anyone this. who knows me, this is a list I did play for a little bit in the past. Uh, I enjoyed the list, but it ended up getting taken apart for what ended up becoming my Yurok uh, Enter the Battlefield deck that I really love. But I'm excited about the list that we have for it. I hope that you guys are excited about it. That is actually going to be our last episode before Kamigawa. Oh. Kamigawa is releasing in two weeks from the point that you hear this episode. Uh, and I uh, promise you, <laughs> listener, we are going to be hitting the ground hard for Kamigawa. We yeah, are really yeah. excited. We're going to be bringing you guys some Kamigawa commanders right away. We really want to hit that stuff right away. We want to enjoy the new set by brewing, because that's what I do anyway, is brew with the new set. <laughs> And so uh, I'm excited to think on running. Mikey, do you have anything else for our listeners before um, we slide it out and have some more fun? <laughs> no, nah, man. Uh, we're super excited for Kamigawa for sure. Um, I'm excited to see what that set brings uh, just as a whole to um, not necessarily the, like, what, what am I saying? Like uh, The new strategies that they're going to bring and stuff like that. I'm really excited for the pre uh, one of the pre-cons, the vehicles pre-con. Buckle up. Seems like a lot of fun. Give me all the Gundams you can give me because uh, that's all I can think about when I see that uh, uh, when I see that pre-con. And it just makes me super excited. Um, you, are, you guys already know. I've said it in the past. I'm trying to make a Yuriko deck. Uh, that will probably be my uh, Demir deck uh, that I'm uh, pretty excited about. So yeah, no, Kamigawa is going to be great. Uh, next week's episode is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I cur currently, and, and Milsey can attest to this, I am looking at Kamigawa spoilers as we speak right now. So guys, if there's any <laughs> of these Kamigawa commanders you see during spoiler season and you really want to see how we would build them, jump in the Discord, yes. let us know. We are not opposed to suggestions when it comes to the decks we do. Uh, we've made a list of some older commanders we'd love to circle back to after we get our fill of Kamigawa, but we truly plan on getting our fill of Kamigawa. We're excited for Neon Dynasty and what it's going to bring to our format. And uh, we hope that you enjoy some of the cool things that we have. But that's all that we have for this morning, this afternoon, this evening for you. And we will catch you guys next time. Later. <laughs>